Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. We are here at SHOT Show 2020 with the first Q&A of the new year, supported by all our Patreon supporters from this incredible, illustrious location. I, don't, I know that this kind of luxury only comes from Patreon support, and I appreciate every one of you that makes that happen. This place is like what the whole hep world would be like on Friday nights if the Nazis had won the war. It is very much like that. We need to find a location, however, where we can actually answer these questions. We have a lot of questions, so on that note, we're going to try and go through as many as we can, but... There's only limited time here in this land that is the amazing thing you see behind us. We're going to just do our best to bring you with us throughout our evening and see what we can make happen for you. That sounds fair. Let's start off with the very first one. Oh, by the way, all Patreon supported. These come from a specific Patreon level and above, $5 and above, and we very much appreciate you Patreon supporters because you keep in range alive. If it wasn't for Patreon, there wouldn't be in range. It's as simple as that. No monetization from anywhere else. Anywhere else. No lords, no masters, only viewers, right? Thank Salute. you. Thank you, guys. Three lock, the first question. What questions do you wish people would ask? Oh, so I do Q&As as well. Um, I can tell you this. Carl is nicer than I am. Uh, I have a hard rule on my Q&As, yep. and he has not implemented it, but if you're ever asking someone a question, avoid superlatives. You know, like, what's the greatest of the, you know, do you think the worst, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your favorite color of the alphabet? Like, because they sound like good questions but they're really not they're they're tiresome they're repetitive you know what's the greatest rifle that you could ever use in this situation well, the problem with those types of statements is there generally never is such a thing as the greatest anything <laughs> yeah. right so that's a hard thing to deal with yeah so at the, the kind of questions i really like are narrowly tailored like if someone were to tell you you're going camping uh with like you're hiking and camping you can only have this much weight on you you might encounter this that or the other in this kind of territory what would you bring and why because it's not like you're asking the broadest, greatest ever. You're saying, what would you do in this exact situation? Oh, you could say, what's the best rifle for a specific circumstance? Yeah. That I could see. Or someone might say, I'm going to a match, and I want to bring two or three spare parts. What are the most likely things that might fail, and what should I have for spare parts? Versus like, who, is, who makes the greatest parts possible. Right, right. Fair. I, I like that. Yeah. I don't really have a better answer than that. It's like when you're telling a joke or telling a story, right? You you constrain the story, and the little details and the constrained details are what make it your own. Make your question your own with something that, and it, it's fun for us because it reflects you. We actually, oh, Caleb K is going to be in Alaska. That's cool for Caleb. Or, you know, Susan thinks she's going to come to Two Gun and maybe she's going to bring this load out. We're like, oh, I wonder if Susan will be there. Yeah. Fair. Chatty PK, any tips or gadgets? so that I can go about my daily life while evading CCTV as much as possible. I don't like the idea of being monitored by unaccountable actors every time I'm out and about. You're going to have better answers than this than probably I will, but there was something that I came aware of, which has been around for a while, but it's now, I think, going to come out Q1 or Q2 of 2020, mm -hmm. which are glasses that reflect infrared and make your whole face a blob of yeah. nothingness. And I forgot the manufacturer, but they had a wide variety of them. Some of them emanated intentionally, mm -hmm. some of them reflected, but the mm -hmm. fact is you put these glasses yeah. on, they look like standard sunglasses, mm -hmm. and most CCTVs are projecting some sort of IR, yeah. or they see in the IR spectrum, even yeah. if they're not projecting it, and when these glasses reflect all that IR, it blows out their sensor. It's like macro vision protection yeah. for for like privacy. It's which macro vision. If you ever tried to dub a VCR tape, that it would mess with the automatic gain control uh, signal in the blanking interval. But uh, yeah, the, this is stuff. That's where it's going to go. It's going to go to small wearable things that aren't great yet. There's fun, have you ever seen one? You mentioned reflecticles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Re reflecticles. That was are, it. That was one of the ones yeah. I was thinking. Now of. those don't. Those look really obvious. So yeah. Corey Doctorow owns one. Lost Boy. No, owns but there's a, a new iteration of coming this year yeah. that are far more demure. They really look yeah. like standard sunglasses. That's where it's going to go. Yeah. So or you can go juggle paint. That's true, right? Juggle juggle paint, paint defeats most image face recognition. It's our generation scramble suit. Yep, it is. It <laughs> but those reflectables and the next iteration thereof mm -hmm. are probably the best yeah. answer. The gun penguin, deviant. For you. What is it like working with the modern rogues? And do you think that lock picking and physical security issues are reaching a wider audience? Uh, so can't say enough nice things about Modern Rogue. Uh, that whole crew, I mean, Brian and Jason are you see in front of the camera, but they have an amazing team um, just behind them. They're, they're like a fully fledged shop. They're not just dinguses like us that edit things with no support, staying up late and like throwing it on YouTube. Um, like they, it's really cool to see them professionally put episodes out. Now, that's a churn because once they start setting that expectation, like they're always like, what's the new idea? We got to keep pace. Like it's demanding. Uh, but I, they're sweet. They're sweethearts. Can't say enough good things about them. Lockpicking lawyer again. He's a friend and a gun guy, by the way. Uh, you may have seen him shoot stuff with Bosnia and Bill. You're gonna see him shooting stuff with us later. I love it. I love collaborations. I know you've said that 
cross pollinations and crossovers don't always they don't get generate there. they don't necessarily generate more views. Yeah, they generate I think a lot of interest into the dedicated audience of both platforms or both creators, but they don't necessarily generate like you think about if you combine channel X and channel Y that both have X amount of or Z amount of views, mm -hmm. you should have Z plus Z equals aggregate. Doesn't seem to work that doesn't way. Doesn't always work that no, way. No, it doesn't. In fact, the views tend to be oddly they tend to be a little lower from what I've seen. Now, not always, but it happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so, next question. Joe Lyons, what outdated cartridge do you wish was in a modern platform? For me, this is pretty easy. There's two. Um, 30 Tokarev is underappreciated, and I think there should be more. We just saw, for example, here at Chacho, Ruger just came out with a 5.7 pistol. Which, by yeah. the way, we didn't do a video on it because it's something I'd rather do a video of while shooting versus just at the Chacho floor. I will tell you right off the bat, the ergonomics of that are far better than the FN version. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting, but I would like to see some pistols coming out in 30 Toke. I think 30 Toke is an underappreciated cartridge. Mm -hmm. And in Rifle, I know, guys, we have 300 Blackout, but I don't know why we haven't seen a rebirth of 8mm Quartz. If we want 300 Blackout, 8mm Quartz did it in the 40s, kind of did it right from the beginning in terms of a of bullet mass versus velocity versus the ability to suppress. That wasn't the goal, but it certainly could. Yeah. I... Frankly, a limiter quartz and 30 toker. I don't want any old cartridges in my platforms. I've been minimizing my cartridges. I sold off all my 40 caliber because 9 millimeter is fine on hot loads now. I have 308 rifles and I have 556 rifles, and I don't have anything interesting. I have this guy if I want to shoot interesting things. Fair enough. And then if it gets beyond my reach, I got the Ian nearby with like. Yeah. What? Yeah. So, uh, what we got here? We got Josh D. How practical or worthwhile is lock picking as a skill in life? Is it something I should learn? I mean, yes, because learning, like, learning is, is awesome in general. I always think that at the, at the age I am now, I'm just learning shit for the sake of staving off the Alzheimer's. <laughs> just do hey, something. You know, practice your, the muscle, right? Yeah, no, that's a real keep thing. Keep it elastic up there, yeah. man. So that's, that's why I do my YouTube thing. I've told people, like, I have a day job. YouTube for me is just a fun avenue for bonding with people and it's a forcing function for me to learn video editing. Oh. I knew how to do a lot of video encoding from when I was like releasing episodes on top sites and shit but yeah learning real video editing which I don't need for my job I just wanted to force myself to learn it. Same reason Tara and I are learning Italian like mm -hmm. we just keep adding languages and so lock picking adding any skill set that can have a practical upshot like if you learn to cook you might not be a chef but you can use that in your everyday and like oh I really I made this these, these three ingredients, I made something great. Like, learning lockpicking, I definitely use it. I definitely have used it in a practical sense. Well, you sense. have a very different role in life in regards to that. Like, you're, you're literally employed to do this. But right? even not in my career. Even just, you know, you're at an Airbnb and the, the key box doesn't work with the code. Of course you'd never do this. I have totally done this. Oh, my goodness. Like, you pull out in the middle of nowhere because I go out camping to an Airbnb cabin and, like, there's no signal. And the code they gave you didn't work, and I've just decoded the But technically, the you're allowed to be in there because you're currently yeah. renting the facility. I mean, I think that might work. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm anal. My, my, my answer to this is a little different than yours. Um, is it something practical that you might need in your real life? There's a chance. But I'll tell you this. Lockpicking, amongst some other things, coding is another one, uh, hacking. Um, these are things that I think that once you get a grasp around the facade of what the image is of the thing, yeah. that it gives you a better, I, I think, a more grounded approach to the realities of life. Yeah. So that sounds like a, such a ridiculous philosophical statement, but once you get to the conclusion that the majority of what is proposed to be physical security around you mm -hmm. is illusory, yeah. and lockpicking definitely shatters that illusion, that that gives you a better way to be more critical thinking amongst many other topics in life, and lockpicking is just the, um, the bicycle for your mind to get to that location. Yeah. Travis R., are cell phone jammers legal if used on private property? And if so, brand model recommendations. I would like to cover a 50 yard or 100 yard diameter circle. Uh, so we just said we're not lawyers, but I can tell you no. Uh, they are not legal. Uh, the only thing that you are kind of allowed to do, and some structures have implemented this, is m like blocking. Not jamming, which is active, but blocking, which is passive. You can construct um, a, either a mesh cage or, sorry, a true Faraday cage has a grounding, true earth ground, but mm -hmm. you can try to do signal blocking. Jammers, uh, A, they're not practical because there's so many frequencies now that you re the old ones were the little ones they are the size of like a cigarette pack and they had four, three or four little antennas. Yep. You would need almost five or seven antennas now to really be effective as a jammer. 
to say nothing of the fact that the reason they get you, it's theft of services, or not theft of services, it's denial of paid services. So the people who may be coming on your property, uh, private property though it may be, yeah. have paid money to their carriers, and they are transacting with their carrier to use the spectrum that has been allotted. Uh, there's also just the government doesn't like you to do government things, because they're like, that's our spectrum and you don't get to di dictate what happens. But that's why it is illegal and also technologically rather impractical. There's also the issue, quite frankly, which I would hope would never happen. But what if there was a legitimate emergency? That's the other. That's they can also jam you on that. That's, 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 they, the, well, that's the that's the No, but that's also argument. that's but that's a moral issue too. If something yeah. did happen, that would be problematic. I mean, one of the thing, all technology cuts both ways, right? It does yeah. good and bad. The reality is the ability to engage emergency services or whatever in the need of a true emergency is a valuable thing. Mm -hmm. So, anyways. Um, yeah. George P. What is your preferred cartridge that basically sits between 556 and 762 NATO? You know, this is interesting because when I hear sits between, mm -hmm. how do we define between? Are we talking about diameter? Are we talking about velocity? Are we talking about foot pounds of energy? Are we talking about ballistic coefficient? What is what is between? Like, so I'm going to take it from the most basic simplistic approach, which is bullet diameter, mm -hmm. which is probably may or may not be what you're looking for, and I'm going to go ahead and say 65 cream. Now, is that underpowered compared to a 7.62 NATO? I don't think I would call it underpowered by that equivalent, but it is technically smaller in diameter. Yeah. So that would be my choice. Yeah, Creedmoor or Grendel. Just to, you already said Creedmoor, so I'll just make Carl mad and say 300 blackout by saying kinetically it's in between the two of them. Okay. And practically it is well below them. 300 kaboom. Chris F., are 22 long rifle conversions for the AR a viable training platform? I don't think so. Okay, so I think you are actually better off with dry fire at this point than you are trying to shove 22LR into mm -hmm. some conversion thingy. 22LR at one time, when 22LR was, it never recovered like it did. Like, back, it used to be the cheapest possible thing you could shoot. It's a lot better than it was, but it is still at the point where it is more expensive than it should be for what it is. Mm -hmm. Those conversions and dedicated 22LR platforms typically are unreliable. That's true. And so I don't think that that is an AR training platform. I would say that it is. I think if you're trying to train with an AR, you can almost get the same amount of things out of a high quality, uh, I'm going to say this, out of a high quality airsoft gun mm -hmm. than you could 22 LR. If your goal is for marksmanship training and precision training, 22 LR can be fantastic, yeah. but that's typically in a dedicated bolt gun. Right. Yeah. Right, it's not uh, it's not going to perform the same out of that gun. I, I liked your airsoft answer for handling and move and scoot, and also you could say again broaden this out the most possible. <clears throat> training like inter introducing kids to shooting, yeah. if they want to go hands on with an AR style platform, and they're just not quite there yet uh, with the recoil impulse or the, the the loudness of it, introducing them to it, maybe. This is almost funny that the I, did you. If you all notice in the Q&As, I've been bombing in with the same question forever. You have. And I'm, and they never would answer because they couldn't. So they didn't uh, have the answer. So I finally just called Jim Sullivan. You got a hold of him. Yeah. And uh, so you're never going to see me asking my crazy question anymore about why they chose 22. What Was there a plan for 223 to match with it? And it was all just kind of a happy accident. He the said, idea was 556 five, diameter of the bullet was identical to 22 LR. And yeah. your thought was, was, was that there intentional? any intentionality? And it turned out to know, be just an oopsie, right? Just kind of one of those quirks in life. Yeah, weird. Louis R, or Louis, depending on the pronunciation. What will our civil liberties look like on a Mars colony? Would it work like company towns in the frontier days? Would we have the protections of our Bill of Rights? Considering we don't have them on the internet, I'm going to say we are not going to have them on Mars, and it will probably look far more like initially some form of government operation, mm -hmm. which will then become sort of corporate operation, which will probably replay exactly all the things that happened in the mining towns of the Old West. It's unfortunate. I could see that being real. That seems like the most yeah. likely scenario. Uh, I will say that my wife and I were just getting into The Expanse, uh, which it seems it's kind of a cute series. I, I, I didn't like it at first. And the reason I didn't like it the very first episode is because it was so dark. And my, I believe that in the goodness of humanity, and I believe we're just not going to have our shit together enough as a society to become a multi-planetary society if we haven't already sorted out things like bigotry and universal basic income and things like that. So maybe if, if there's humans like living in cities on Mars, we're going to be at a post-scarcity society maybe at that point. But when it's just, we're talking about colonies. When it's just an outpost, it's going to be a dumpster fire possibly. I would say go look look back at the early history of Jamestown mm -hmm. and that will be the first Mars colony. Yeah. I, I hate to say this. I predict that the first one, everyone will die and there will be subsequent attempts after that. No, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not. It's the likely scenario. However, 
the next question pinches into this, and I'm yeah. going to answer that interesting. So I just said, probably the first people on the first colony are going to die, mm -hmm. and you and I might be old enough to see the first gunfight on Mars. That's true. How what an exciting time to live. But another uh, viewer, your Patreon supporter, Ian, if your current salary was triple, would you become a Mars colonist? No. Yes. I used to think, like, when Mars One was a thing, like, the, because Mars One was this idea, it's going to be one way. Like, just yeah, who, I know. who can get out there? You get there and you yeah. stay. When I didn't have a relationship and I was, I was all gung-ho for it. I was like, fuck it, why not? Go for it. Uh, I like where I am now. I like my bed. I like my full Earth gravity. I'd go. Yeah, I could see you going. Yeah, I'd want to be the tip of that spear. You could have the first gunfight on Mars. I, I don't know that I'd want to be part of that, but I would want to be the first one to try and smash a dent and prevent it from becoming the what we just described a minute ago as Jamestown or a corporate town. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd go. Brock G. I'm curious about your thoughts about lead-free ammunition alternatives, one being Simex, a Utah company. If I hype it up a lot in marketing, will better ammunition change a lot in firearms industry? I don't have a there on this. Um, I, the lead-free ammunition I fired is fine, works fine. It tends to cost a little more because of the manufacturing. If all things are created equally and the costs were relatively close, I would choose lead-free over non-lead because it is better environmentally and for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. As long as it performed well, I have no reason. I have no like weird desire to have lead in my projectile. I don't care as long as it works. So will I take lead-free if it's there to offer to me? Yes, I would. But I want it to work and I want it to not be prohibitively expensive in the process. Yeah. Same answer. Okay. Zachary L. Would InRange ever do a what Kalashnikov? What would Kalashnikov do, AK? This is a hard one. I, I've toyed with this, and you might have seen years ago there was some me playing around with it. I went through the Zenico catalog. Boy, Zenico is a bag of hurt, let me tell you that. I did the KNS adjustable gas piston, which there's still more content to come on that on InRange. Yeah, yeah. uh, that is a great product. There are lots of interesting things you can do to augment the standard AK. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the gigantic market that is that which is the AR-15 in this country mm -hmm. manifests in a way that things like carbon fiber and modern materials and really more distinctive, unusual thinking comes to the table with the AR-15 that does not come to the table with the Kalashnikov platform. Yeah. Additionally, the Kalashnikov platform, as good as it is, was not designed in a way that lends itself to modularity like the AR-15 was. Mm -hmm. When they were designing the AR-15, I don't think that was their goal. I think that was a happy coincidence that it became yeah. as modular as it is, but it turned out to be quite modular. The AK, you really have to like hodgepodge things onto it. The happy coincidence of the AR that might not actually be a firearm. Right. Because the courts are now realizing, like, wait, there's the receiver isn't part of the chamber, and oops. Yeah, if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's kind of an interesting thing. The AR-4 weirdly falls into this strange loophole of confluence of laws that I wonder if like what thing. would Mikhail have done is like get a visa leave country <laughs> grow know, up grow up somewhere else <laughs> interesting quote from him and I'm paraphrasing him but there's a quote from him in which he's talked about Eugene Stoner is a rich man living a, a good life mm -hmm. but his name is not on any of his weapons yeah. my name is all over my weapons and he lived relatively poor yeah. in a hut yeah he had like a government stipend at the end of his yeah. life or whatever interesting Mark S what are your thoughts on seriously using a Ruger PC carbine as home defense in band states? I have no issue with that at all. I mean, um, any type of long arm is generally better than a small a, a pistol for in terms of being accurate and reliable under stress. Mm -hmm. And I, I do not have extensive experience with the Ruger PC carbines. However, I from what I've seen, Ruger products are almost always generally well made and reliable. So I have absolutely no thoughts, neither no negative thoughts on that being a appropriate home defense weapon as long as you've done your homework. Make sure yours works and you choose your ammunition wisely. Yeah. Multiple points of contact are always better. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all. The only exception being if you live in such a tiny, tiny confines of a place, like if you live in a little efficiency apartment and you don't have even the room to put a, a safe place to store it, but you can have a little lockbox with a pistol, like maybe, okay, that's why pistols are pistols. Yep. All right, so CJS, would you consider the LMT or Surefire Enhanced Bolt Carrier as a vi viable addition to the What Would Stoner Do project? We will not consider the Surefire one, I can say that right now, because the Surefire one is designed very specifically for full auto purposes and for increasing dwell time in those applications, as well as the, the weight system in the rear to decrease or remove. Carrier balance in full auto will not cycle with the captured spring system that we've standardized in the What Would Stoner Do project. That said, we do have videos coming that we're, we're going to discuss our choices in the bolt carrier group. 
Um, I can just tell you the Surefire is not one of them because of those reasons, but we will be discussing that in a future video and all of the reasons why. So stay tuned for that. There you go. Felix B. How high of a height over bore offset is too high for rifles, practically speaking? Okay, you give you oh, uh, as high as when you start missing. Well, <laughs> I think the Russian chin roll thing is problematic. I mean, <clears throat> it, it has some. There are some benefits. There is a there is a thing in regards to potentially having a little more situational awareness, mm -hmm. like kind of being heads up. But marksmanship suffers, mm -hmm. and I know here I can already see the comments. But training, if you train, well, okay, you could probably train to also hold it 45 degree angles upside down with your head cocked this way, and if you do it long enough, you're going to be okay. But is that what you want to deal with under stress? No. You want it to be the most reliable, consistent, predictable thing. And that's where the American rule, the American approach to marksmanship and proper weld and low height bore offset provides a lot of benefits. As well as, of course, that if you're shooting at a target close, seven yards or in, you don't have this ridiculous holdover so that you need you don't accidentally shoot under what you're trying to actually hit. Yeah. Um, I personally think my number on this is right about three inches. After three inches, I start to get real, real nervous. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Almost everything in AR lands about two and a half to three inches. Yeah. If it's more than three, like what? How is that even mounted? What's happening? This is when you have like RMRs on top of ACOGs and stuff, and it gets yeah. it gets really weird. And you got parallax for zero, and it's it's ugly. Yeah. So you agree? I would agree with that. Okay. Dominic. It was fascinating to see how 7.62x51 and 7.62x39 perform out of short barrels. Would supersonic 300 blackout outperform both when fired from a similarly short barrel? And illuminator clerks by another viewer, uh, Andreas. And, um, well, yeah, it is really interesting to note that barrel length dictates a lot in regards to velocity. Um, supersonic 300 blackout, I don't have much experience with 300 blackout. I have avoided 300 blackout, to yeah. be honest with you. I do not believe in it as a cartridge. I believe it introduces risk. So I don't really deal with it. I don't want it in my inventory. I haven't done anything with 300 blackout. Um, would it outperform both? I think it would be very similar to 762 by 39. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's 300 blackout, even going supersonic, is still going to have a, a really weird trajectory. It is, it is a people shot round in really close distances. That's the only, that's, that's the only thing anyone I know uses it for. And 8mm Quartz is ballistically almost identical to 3 Black, and I've said this before, mm -hmm. I'll say it again, go look at the data. 8mm Quartz, which was in the 40s, in, of course, in Germany, is essentially the same cartridge except for the bullet diameter. Mm -hmm. Tim K, do you think that replacing as many steel parts as possible, trigger pins, takedown pins with titanium ones, is worth it on the Boltman Stoner Dew project, or is it too expensive for too little weight savings? Well, we've always talked about in this project that ounces add up to pounds. Mm -hmm. And we are going to deal with alternative materials for our muzzle device to keep the weight down at the front end of the gun. Mm -hmm. We're, of course, dealing with modern materials like carbon fiber and polymer. In terms of actual pins and such, no. That yeah. is exactly, you're now shaving off like tenths of ounces or halves of ounces. And that starts to become a little ridiculous in terms of the, val the value to benefit of cost, manufacture, production, and be able to facilitate the gun. Yeah, but that's kind of where I would come in as well. Because the, there's a common word, and I have often I use this word when talking about locks and security. It, it's a word that applies in many good contexts, and it can cut through a lot of clouded judgment. And the word is meaningful. If you put those parts in titanium, would it make the gun lighter? Yes. Would it make it meaningfully lighter? No. Exactly. Exactly. Just like when someone says, is this lock? I've, I've locked my, my bags with this little TSA lock. Have you, like in a court of law, could you testify I have locked this bag? Yes. Has it been meaningfully secured? No. It becomes an academic exercise that's yes. interesting on paper, but in practice has little application. Yeah. Old Man Winter. What are the security implications of smart devices and connected devices like Amazon Play and Ring doorbells? Mm -hmm. And some other guy, Deviant? Yeah, I, I, I dropped you my You commented thoughts. on this a yeah. little bit. Smart people never talk to police. <clears throat> Smart home people. My house talks to the police without my knowledge. Yeah. Okay, so we know this, right? We know that all of these things in your house, um, we know for a fact that Amazon does, uh, yeah. pretty much constantly record and shove it to a giant database in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, there is likelihood to believe the same as the d issue with Siri, mm -hmm. but Apple's a little different. They may or may not. Um, Apple but doesn't monetize your data the way that other companies do. Apple has a slightly different approach. I'm not saying that you should trust that either. I'm just saying that Apple's not confirmed. Alexa is confirmed. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So uh, what are the security implications? The security implications are a couple things. One, first of all, um, you're not talking about connected 
door lock. You said ring doorbell, so that's safer than a door lock. Those are different okay. issues. Um, but like, I don't know. It really depends on your particular level of comfort with privacy in regards to the corporate oligarchy we now live under. Yeah. And the uh, Carl nailed it. The Ring one is the really the scariest. Ring is openly, and it's known, they're openly giving data to the police without even the police getting a subpoena. Like, no one even goes to the judge, magistrate, courts anymore. They just say, hey, there was a crime on this block. Give us all these Ring cameras around this time of day. That's and because Ring, they're Ring external, right? It. But it's because they're external. It's outside your house. Well... Ring is still a private company. They could say, right, boy, right. we'd love to help. Yeah, Go but Ring is a, complicit. Yeah, they're very complicit. I don't care for Ring for that reason. But legally speaking, it's also external to the house. If the camera was internal to the house, they're doing that. That would be a bigger concern. It would be, but again, I think that if you have cameras internal, you're still putting them... Like, For example, my wife and I use Nest. Nest is a Google product. Uh, I use it because it's easy to stand Nest up. thermostat or cameras? No, or? not the thermostat, just cameras. Okay, all right. Um, we have cameras on the outsides of our entrances. And I don't care too much because I don't really think they're, I have the same standard of privacy on my front door and in my driveway. Uh, and I, I know, like, even though Nest might or might not share that with the police without my knowledge. Now, the, the camera that's inside our house, which we have a Nest camera in our house, that is hard switch. And we only use it when we go away on vacation. We hard switch physically it on, powered on, physically powered off. Yeah. Because, yes, it's in my house, but there's nothing to tell me. There's no guarantee that Nest wouldn't just give it the footage uh, with with a request. I agree with that. So it really comes down to your comfort and about privacy. I, I will say this, and this sounds like a very negative statement, for the most part, we've talked about this in some of the Q&As, mm -hmm. I believe we live in a post-privacy age, age, a post-privacy era. I think this ideas of privacy, which I think are things that we should not have surrendered, we have, for the most part. There are exceptions, and the most diligent people can sometimes recapture some of that. But it is a very difficult endeavor, and to live in modern society with the concept of what we thought was privacy at one point to what we think we have now is a very hard thing to achieve. I'm more optimistic than Carl. Okay. I'm more at the point where I think we just need to accept people for being people, and the stuff that we think are, oh my goodness, I can't believe that we found this out, for the most part, unless they're acting they're like acting in normal, decent ways, but oh my goodness. Like, that, let's get rid of the oh my goodness pearl clutching and just like, people are people, and accept people for that. To a large oh my degree. goodness, I can't believe that this famous gun guy is a sexual scumbag with his that's subservient. Di that's, that's different. That's, that's immoral behavior. I'm talking yeah. about things that are normal behavior that are I know. socially inappropriate for ridiculous reasons. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, Dan and W, what is the point of the MR556 for U.S. consumers since the benefits of a piston gun are better performance in short barrels and full autos? I'm going to be completely bluntly honest on this one. The reason for the MR556 in the U.S. consumer market is because people want to buy HK products at expensive prices. That is going to be one of those things. When we, we look around at... The, like the aim, aim, I'm not denigrating HK, I'm not denigrating mm -hmm. Aimpoint, mm -hmm. but you look at the Acro versus some Holosun, their new line, like some people are just going to want to buy Aimpoint because they know the logo, they know the brand, they know the name, they know the, the reputation that it, they, they think it has. Yep. Yeah. I don't, I, if you want one, I'm saying, don't, I'm not saying don't get one, heck, I have one. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, it's like, there is, there is more differences in that gun. There are more differences in that gun than just the piston. Mm -hmm. I do plan to have a video about that at some point, by the way. We but, saw that gun in the mariachi suitcase at the HK party, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was but badass -like. I do plan to have more content about it, but is there a real need for anyone besides someone shooting short barrels or full auto? No, there isn't. Justin, ask twice. What do you think of small-scale shooting competitions hosted on public property? And any experiences and considerations. I don't think there's anything wrong with it if you're doing this amongst you and your friends in a safe and intelligent way. Um, in terms of hosting it like a desert brutality match, that's not viable from a liability perspective. We need to be on what's essentially an official range with official liability insurance and all those things that come with running an official public event. If it's you and your buddies and you want to do something to train on public property, such as um, BLM land in Arizona, as long as you have a proper backstop and you're safe and sane, I have no issues with that at all. It's just not something that we could run as a quote-unquote public event. Yeah, I mean, when it's an event, like the DEF CON shoot was on public land forever. But the risk there is that any functionary from the government, you don't know if somebody is going to pass an ordinance that says, oh, there's a fire warning today. Like, you can't go to that territory. And we've had to scramble for the DEF CON shoot in the past, like changing locations. 
all the amazing investment of time and money and booking and logistics that goes into running a competition, the risk of having the plug pulled if something goes awry with a bureaucrat, that's a little much for me. It's real. Yeah. All right, you know what? It's time for our reservations. Yeah, we're going to go continue this at dinner maybe. Let's go do that.